our loves and sisters. It's good to see everyone here in God's temple, in His house. I invite you, everyone, please, please stand up and let's prepare our hearts to worship Him, Almighty God. When there's no way, God always make a way. When there's a desert, God's making rivers. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'll put the things away that are not mine and I'll get my stuff out. So you've got the scripture in your hand, and if you don't, there are some young ladies that have copies. Do you need a copy of the scripture? Okay. 
And by the way, if anyone is interested in a complete copy of the Gospel of Mark, those are available. And um, I hope that uh, it brings clarity and I hope it's useful to you. It's wonderful uh, to not only uh, be able to have information in your hand, but to be able to understand it. And I know that uh, there are many translations of the scripture out there. I know that each translation has a particular reason for its development. Some are for the purpose of study, some are for the purpose of clarity and easy understanding. Some uh, are, are put together for the purpose of uh, street use, understanding street language. People talk differently, languages change especially the English language. There's a few things I'd like to change in the English language, but uh, it's not as easy as you might think. I've had more success trying to do it from the street. <laughs> it seems like the people who are out on the street just, as they would say, jamming with each other, uh, they have a better ability to change the language and our word usage perhaps than even our grammarians, okay? So here we are today with the Word of God before us, with the Word of God in our hand, thankfully. It's wonderful that God has chosen to communicate with us not only by His Word, and I'm going to say this again as I have in weeks past, I'm a literal biblicist. That doesn't mean that I take things that were meant to be imagery and whatnot and look at them as if they are literal rather than being, you know, uh, uh, word usage. And uh, for an example, we, we talk about poetic license. Um, but I believe that what we have in our hand as the Word of God, in its original were the words of God. God has spoken. And as we prepare our hearts for prayer this morning, I'm going to say again what I've said so many times. If this book that we hold in our hands is not the Word of God, then God has not spoken. And I'm thankful for a God who informs us a God whose desire is that we might know truth in a world where people say truth is relative, that's, that's an oxymoron in itself. Um, truth, just as God is one, truth is one. And you have that at your disposal and use in your hand today that you might understand the mind of God through his word. Are there any special requests for prayer this morning as we come before the Lord as a church? And, and that's another wonderful privilege besides having the word of God being able to be part of the body of Christ. Special requests. I know that she, yes. Oh my, yes. Uh, it's, it's quite unbelievable and with the, do you know what the death toll is up to? That's it. And even with the bodies that they can account for, they're beyond recognition and identity. How tragic. So there's, Besides the huge number of deaths and the missing individuals, you can only imagine the grief and emotion uh, amongst everyone involved. And because we are a nation um, that professes to be one nation under God, our hearts need to grieve and to mourn for those who have lost and for those who are lost in that horrible situation. My, my wife uh, is coming back from Indiana today. Uh, she lost her father last week. 
And um, if, if we could keep that whole situation in prayer. And I would like it if someone would get a hold of Henry, and you look like a good person, if you could get a hold of your husband and have him turn the, the air conditioning fan off, okay? We get a, a whistling sound, and I'm, I'm not good at speaking along with a whistle. But let's pray together. Father, we're thankful this morning for the privilege of prayer. It's actually a responsibility for us as your people to come and approach the God of all creation, the God of all eternity, and to do so in an act of intercession, praying on behalf of others. And as we think of this special request that has come up regarding the people of Maui in Hawaii, uh, we, we can't even imagine what's going on there even as we try to watch it on the networks. We can't imagine what's taking place in the hearts of those who have had to face and be involved in such a tragedy. Father, I pray for other members of this body of Christ who are not with us today for whatever reason. Uh, I pray for Sherry as she comes back from Indiana. I pray for the family there who has lost a, a patriarch, a wonderful man of God who was in the ministry for 65 years and pastored so many congregations as well as shepherding individuals. So many that were at the memorial said, uh, it was Pastor Gunn that led me to Christ. It was Pastor Gunn who baptized me, who performed our wedding, who took care of the funerals in our family, and now he's with you, and we thank you, our God, for uh, the wonderful prospect of being forever with the Lord and for those that have served you as we're going to be speaking today and served you well to hear a word of approval at the end of the journey well done good and faithful servant and so we leave ourselves in your care this morning we ask you that you would give clarity not only in our subject matter today but also in the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And if there's anyone here today that has not yet accepted Christ, we pray that the word of God would touch their hearts. And as faith comes by hearing the word of God, that in hearing that word, their very heart of hearts would be touched with these truths and that they might have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his worthy name. Amen. I have a lot before me today, and I, I don't think that you can preach the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly John, uh, and feel like you've got limited subject matter. <laughs> I, I look at a chapter and where it would be nice to take a chapter a week. I find myself, even when I have to divide a chapter up, uh, to run out of time before I run out of material. <laughs> and so it's like that thing that people say when the economy is bad, I, I have too much week left at the end of the money. And uh, here, here we are dealing with this thing. I, 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 I've made the comment, you know, get, God doesn't have to wear a watch. And I've got this digital clock staring me in the face, and I'm aware that uh, we've, we've just got a limited amount of time to share the word. So I need to move right in. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. In fact, I would like to begin, and you have it before you, I would like to begin at verse 27, Mark 8 and 27, because there is a statement made by the Apostle Peter 
Simon Peter as we know him uh, concerning his take, his opinion, his understanding of who Jesus is. And of course, uh, whenever there's anything new, there's always a lot of discussion. Uh, what's your what's your understanding on this? And Jesus comes to his disciples, whom he called apostles, and he questioned them, who do people say that I am? Verse 28, and they answered him, John the Baptist, some say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. Let, let me just break here for a moment. I find that kind of interesting because it does say that in the minds of those whom Jesus is speaking with, as well as, yes, the, the community, they had an understanding, whether it was right or not, that after this life, there is a continuation, there is a life to come. Now in the religious world, and I suppose in society itself, and I've watched enough on the internet to know that people have all kinds of notions, most of them without any foundation or backing, about what takes place when we breathe our last and leave this life to enter into the great beyond, which the Bible calls eternity. And I, I guess understanding how important what we possess in life is, the very fact of life and living, it, it should be interesting to us. We should be concerned about where we will be when all is said and done in our experience personally. <clears throat> where the question used to be, will you spend eternity? And we live in a world of limits. We live in a world of boundaries, and rightly so. On the other hand, we understand in our finite, in our limited minds, we understand that there is outer space. Where does that end? Well, there's not an answer for that. We know that time runs out, and as we think of time, we think of time past, as well as time future, uh, where did it begin, when does it end? We measure time by certain, by certain factors. I, I was on the internet just the last week or so, and they say that due to some changes uh, in the inner earth, uh, the uh, the days are speeding up. Oh yeah, just by a fraction of a second, but it could add up to the point that they're going to need to adjust that on the atomic clock. So uh, this year, uh, we had one of the longest days ever by a fraction of a second. I hope you enjoyed the uh, wink and nod, uh, whether you had it to enjoy during the day or at night. I hope you slept well or had fun with that fraction of a second. But uh, time outside of measurement, which by the way began in creation, uh, it's fascinating that God created and separated day from night before he designed and created those indicators that we watch that tell us as the sun is in the center of the sky, it's noontime and sundials, I, I don't think that you can adjust a sundial to a fraction of a second, but they're pretty good at letting us know when noon is. And the Bible speaks of things like shifting shadows and that God has no shifting shadow. That's because he is the light. You and I see the shifting of shadows because the earth turns. And we figuratively speak, and we say the sun comes up and goes down. It doesn't. Uh, the earth turns. 
little science there for you. And, and yet we understand the figurative ideas because if you weren't scientific at all, and I've been accused of that, but if you weren't scientific at all, you'd see the sun come up each day, you'd see it go down each day, and you'd say, well, hello, that's an interesting phenomenon. And you wouldn't have to look at this globe from outer space to see it as a sphere turning on its axis. Okay, enough of our science lesson this morning, but um, the, the thing of time and space which, by the way, is a factor that people speak in terms of when they're discussing philosophy. Matters of time and space. And here we are in our specific, in our particular time, and in our space, and we, we get fussy about that. Don't waste my time. Uh, don't crowd my space. And you'd never believe how much this really involves us in our day-to-day -day experience. Can I say to you this morning, as we get into Mark chapter 8 and these final verses, that God is concerned about our time and space. And even more particular and specific, he's, con he's concerned about you. And where you are in the regard of time and eternity and space and where you will spend eternity. And it's an issue that God was so concerned about. He addressed it by coming into the world and actually dwelling, living amongst mankind. Uh, John chapter 1 says... Speaking of Jesus as the Word, God's message, that's what we're talking about, God has spoken. The Word became flesh, became human in form, and lived here amongst us. And when we beheld Him, we saw His glory as that of, and it doesn't have the word Son in there. It just says the glory as of an only begotten of the Father. And yet we know that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, because God is the eternal Father. I became a father when Caleb was born. And uh, he and I had a nice talk yesterday on our way, way back from Indiana. He's my son. And I was not a father until one Sunday morning on my birthday. He showed up at 721. And interestingly enough, I went home and showered and shaved and got in the car and I made it to church on time to say, I've got a baby boy. And uh, those of you that are sitting there, our handsome young men, and even our grumpy old men that we have here in our congregation, somebody was excited about the fact that you were born into this world, and what a what a happy occasion, I hope, uh, maybe they want a girl, but nevertheless, I mean, what a happy occasion that we, each of us, began our experience in time. God's concerned about that. And in fact, Jesus experienced birth. I, I mentioned as I was speaking at a funeral yesterday uh, that Jesus outlived my father-in-law. My father-in-law lived to be in his 90s, and Jesus only made it to somewhere in the early 30s, probably 32 to 33, somewhere in there. I've outlived Jesus. <laughs> Imagine that. That's an accomplishment. But... Um, the people of Jesus' day, as he was speaking, that, getting back to my point here, they had an understanding, it seems, whether it was specific or generalized to the point of abstract, that there's something beyond life. And they seemed to see that it had to do with persons and personalities. It was a personal thing. They even put names in the regard of Jesus, who is this guy? And there were some that said, because John the Baptist, we find this in the Gospels, had been killed by Herod. And um, there were those, and, and in fact, even Herod himself said, it's John the Baptist who I slew. He has risen from the dead. So there was an understanding to some degree of resurrection. They didn't know what it looked like. In fact, even after Lazarus was raised from the dead, they didn't really have an understanding of resurrection until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Okay? So I'm saying these things because many times we take this so for granted that we don't even think these things through. You need to, you need to think this through. So they had this idea of who Jesus was. He was somebody, and, and maybe they believed in reincarnation, which if you do the etymology on that, that means to come back in the flesh again. And uh, people that believe in reincarnation, uh, they concern themselves with squishing a bug or killing of an animal or any form of life because that may be someone that you knew from a previous life and they've come back as a, as a moose or a mouse or um, I, I squished a huge cockroach one day and was immediately rebuked for that. But the Bible speaks of resurrection. And let me tell you why I like and why I'm glad that the truth of Scripture teaches resurrection. Because, and, and, and this, this comes from an old song from the 60s, I Gotta Be Me. Okay, that was Frank Sinatra. And the wonderful thing is that in my next life experience, I'm going to be the guy that you know. The Bible says, then shall we be known even as we are known. I don't want to be somebody else. I mean, Scott, you're a nice guy, but I'm good with me. And wonderfully, there is just a concept inherent in the lives of every individual that this life isn't all there is. Let's move on. Verse 29, he said unto them, And who do you say that I am? And Peter answering said to him, You are the Christ. You are the anointed one of God. You are the one that the Jewish people, the Hebrew people coming from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are the one foretold who would come into this world. And Peter, in other words, has taken the truth of the word of God. He has analyzed it. He has applied it to Jesus and believes that this one that was prophesied, predicted of old, is indeed, this Jesus is the Christ of God. And we looked at that last week and Peter was right on. And Jesus gives him credit for that. He said to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Wow. Okay. Um, Peter answering said to him, you are the Christ. And he commanded them, he charged them that she should tell no one of him. And as we go into verse 31, I just want to mention to you, this portion of scripture and this event that we're reading of is also found in the other Gospels, particularly in Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 21. It says, and he began, pay attention to that word, I actually circled it. If you've got a writing device, you might want to circle it as well. He began teaching them. And up until this time, specifically in the Gospel of Mark, there isn't a mention of what we call the passion of the Christ. Jesus being accused as he was falsely, being judged in a court of law, being sentenced even though he was unconvicted. If you know anything about the judicial system and even our judicial system comes out of the biblical system that we read having to do with the law of Moses. I, I, I want you to get the connection here. He began teaching them that the Son of Man, that's himself, must, circle that, must suffer much and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and killed. Now keep in mind he's speaking of himself. This is hard stuff. Killed and after three days resurrect. Come back to life. Okay, hold that thought. Oh, circle resurrect, okay. And taking him aside, and, and I, I really appreciate Peter's respect here. 
because he's going to correct Jesus. He's going to rebuke him, taking him aside from the crowd. Peter began to rebuke him. And in fact, the other gospels tell us that Peter said, this will, this will never, we're not going to let this happen to you. Verse 33. But Jesus turned about and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter before them all. And rightly so. And isn't it fascinating that he says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, this is a play on words. Peter is not the devil. On the other hand, notice what Jesus says, because you regard not the things of God, but the things of men. Now, if you're thinking that Jesus is really severe, that he's really being hard on Peter, it's not only that Jesus is speaking of his imminent death and his dealing with the authorities that would take him to the cross, but I had you circle resurrect. <laughs> because, yes, Jesus being involved in suffering, Jesus ultimately being killed. Yes, that's, that's severe. That's bad news. But the good news is he rose again. Peter was only hearing the bad news. That would be like me standing up to preach the gospel, which the Bible says is good news, and just telling you about your sin, telling you about the judgment of God, telling you about hellfire and condemnation and the eternal lake of fire and everlasting destruction for those who do not come to Jesus and never getting to the story about Jesus. You'd say, well, that wasn't very good news. This comment that Jesus makes regarding himself as he begins to talk about his passion. If you've ever seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, it's not about the life of Jesus. It has to do with those final days and hours that took him to the cross and then ultimately to his resurrection. And there's very little good news in that movie. I came out of that movie and I said to a friend of mine, I said, what did you think? And he just said, and, and by the way, he had a full tub of popcorn and a full glass of some kind of soda and he never touched it. That movie just drained him. And it drained me. It's not a movie that you'd want to watch over and over and over. I mean, there's people that sit and watch reruns on TV. Some of them are as goofy as can be. But I'll tell you what. The passion of the Christ is horrifying. And in fact, what happened to Jesus caused his appearance to be so that he didn't even look human. It's not good news. But his glorious resurrection that he would after three days resurrect says to me that because he lives, I shall live also. And I hope that you young men and I hope that our young ladies at the back understand that the message of the gospel is, yes, tragic because of sin and because of our fallen condition. But it's good news because the one who died for our sins rose again from the dead on the third day, even as he said, and you and I believe in this one who rose. We believe in him as the giver of life. In fact, we believe in him as the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father. No one can approach God apart from Jesus Christ. And I have to say at this point, will you come to Jesus? Let's go to verse 34. Calling the people unto him and his disciples, he said unto them, anyone wishing to follow me or to follow after me, here's that word again, circle this, must. <laughs> must deny himself and take up his cross and by the way, this is good grammar. You might say, why isn't he using they and them? <laughs> grammar says that when it's unspecified, it's always in the male gender, okay? 
And I've struggled with that because of the fact that I, I've been published and uh, in the publications that I have had put out, uh, I had nine proofreaders. And as I was trying to be a little more gender neutral, they said, you can't do that, it's not proper, it's not proper English. And especially when you go from singular to the plural. And now you can use they, them and such, but you can't, in the regard of someone leaving their jacket, refer to them as they or them. I just did that, refer to him as they or them. See what I mean? Drives you crazy. Nevertheless, it's proper English grammar. We, we discussed something last week about how in the Greek, the use of the double negative does not make a positive as it does in English. Go figure that one out. But it's, can I say it like that? It's the way it is. And if you take a different perspective on it and answer differently on an examination, you're going to have a little red mark by your mistake and you're going to be graded accordingly. So those of you that are getting ready to go back to school or start college, uh, you need to, let me recommend the book called The Grumpy Grammarian. It's just the best. And boy, I'll tell you, I read it and I shook my head and I shook my fist. And then I, I just resigned myself to the fact that my English needed to be right. Because there were going to be people reading it and they were going to be going like, oh, goodness. And I have to say to you at this point, and this is one of the things that are changing right now. People in the regard of Jesus teaching, J-E-S, U.S. apostrophe or Moses law, M-O-S-E-S -S apostrophe. That's proper English. And they want to change that now. In fact, uh, you'll hear pastors on TV refer to Jesus's teaching or Moses's law. I just cringe. <laughs> but this is the word of God and Good grammar or bad grammar, I want you to get a few things right today. And that's why I had you circle some words, things like must. Anyone wishing to follow me must deny himself and take up his cross, then follow me. And, and this, this that we're looking at today is very similar to what we have in the Gospel of John chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 30, where it says... When Jesus had said these things, many believed on him. And you're going, oh goody. And then he says, if you would be, if you would truly be my disciple, oh, uh, continue in all those things that I have said unto you. I'm paraphrasing there. Now that doesn't mean that I'm preaching a work salvation. Because the work of salvation was accomplished at the cross and it had a period at the end of it where Jesus said, it is finished. And there remains nothing for us to do but receive a finished accomplishment, receive that Christ died for our sins according to the word of God, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and by the way, he was buried according to Jewish custom, which adds to an understanding of his resurrection, because there were things that they saw, and they saw those things, the grave clothes and such, because of the way how he was buried. But he rose again according to the word of God, according to the scriptures, and then this is for you and me. He was seen. I wasn't there. I'm an old guy, but that's 2,000 years ago, give or take. But the eyewitness testimony of this man who proved in deed and in word that he was unlike any other man, the proof of who Jesus is is that he rose again from the dead and it was witnessed by many hundreds and they put those things that they saw in writing. And this has happened from this pulpit before. I'm just going to say it like this. In my most profound manner, <clears throat> I believe. I believe because 
I believe the Bible is the word of God. I believe because the God of the Bible is the one true God. And if you compare him with the gods of other religions, and I have, you would find that in their, in their final understanding, there's always something that doesn't fit. Okay? And my understanding of God involves what's called a theodicy. You don't have to take that word home with you. But it's neat that when you take a look at the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and what was accomplished by God at the cross to fulfill the claims of justice against guilty sinners, this gospel message regarding Jesus the Christ fits. And there's no holes in it. So I have a theodicy. I have an understanding of redemption and salvation, of the relationship between God and man, the relationship between theos, theology, and anthropos, humankind, and see that God's purpose in coming to this world was to create a relationship whereby man could know God and that relationship is through acquainting yourself, acquaintance with Jesus Christ. So, once you come to Christ and believe on him, as Peter does, what Peter said is absolutely true, even though almost in the next sentence, Jesus had to rebuke him as he did. Oh my goodness. I mean, for Jesus to say, blessed art thou, Simon, and then to turn around and say, call him Satan, you're going to have some ups and downs in your Christian experience. Just let me tell you that ahead of time. Because even though... You and I were designed for perfection. We are forced to live in an imperfect world. And that's why the Bible teaches that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever comes to him, whoever receives him, whoever believes on him will not perish. Uh, apart from Jesus Christ, we would perish in our sins. But there is this wondrous good news of salvation. But when you come to Christ, you've still got a lot of stuff, negative stuff, from your experience, from your very nature, that is going to take a while to get worked out in your walk with the Lord. That's why the apostle says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean that you get saved by what you do. It means that if you have accepted what Christ has done for you, it's going to take some work to get through life and to do it successfully. And so going along with that thing that we were designed for perfection, but forced to live in an imperfect world, that means that many times you and I are going to have to learn that our accomplishments are not always successes. Sometimes we have to learn to settle. And finding out where that line of demarcation is takes experience and wisdom. That's what our portion is about today. How do I live the Christian life and we're going to, as the title of my message is, we're going to find out what the cost of being a disciple is. And Jesus makes it very clear. It's interesting, as he was speaking to them uh, in verse 32, speaking about what would be happening to them, it says he spoke unto them openly. And this that we have before us in these verses is very open speech. He is not speaking to them in parables. This is, this is just a fact. That you and I 
need to recognize that there's a cost involved and that as we go on in our Christian experience, we're going to learn what it costs to be a disciple of Jesus. I quoted a young man by the name of William Featherston. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, he wrote one of the best hymns of all time. Uh, the, the little hymn that he wrote, and by the way, it's the only hymn that he wrote. He wrote it at 15 years old. And it's that little verse that says at the end of each verse that if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. I'm going to say goodbye to those things that used to mean so much to me. And at 15 years old, as a new convert, he wrote those words. And I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow if ever I love thee. My Jesus, tis now. I quoted the third verse at my father's funeral yesterday. I would love thee in life. I would love thee in death. I would praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. There's a cost to following Jesus. Interestingly, William Featherston died at a very young age and he had sent a copy of that little poem. It wasn't set to music. To an aunt and when she heard of his death, she rummaged through her drawers to find the letter and sure enough there it was and someone set it to music and we sing it we sing it even today we've got guys over here we got gals out there that are 14 15 16 years old where are you at in your walk with the lord have you recognized what it costs to say yes to jesus and then live for his glory so that you and i might have successes in life it's kind of a paradox. You die to live. You say goodbye to the things that you had written down as far as goals and agendas. And you realize, as Jesus taught us to pray, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he walked away from that little single-person prayer meeting to go to the cross and lay down his life for us. I, I've got a couple of things. I, 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 I've been questioning whether I should read them or not. But, but here's one, and this is from uh, Michael Card. So come lose your life for a carpenter's son, for a madman who died for a dream. And you'll have the faith his first followers had but you'll feel the weight of the beam. Take up your cross. So surrender the hunger to say you must know. Have the courage to say I believe. As the power of paradox opens your eyes. Blinding those who say they can see. I have to tell you there's so many things regarding my life, regarding my walk of, as a Christian, where I've had to say, I still, I just don't get it. And yet I believe, I, there's things in Scripture, there are, there are issues that I struggle with, some of them because I'm such a mess. But I'm willing to say, I believe. And that settles it. By the way, I have to tell you, if God says it, whether I believe or not, settles it. If God has spoken, it is truth. And you and I stand upon that, even though we shake our heads and say, I just can't see it. I just don't get it. 
And what happens when we come to that juncture in our lives where we're willing to step back and let God have his way, you know, we find freedom in that. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the scripture says, uh, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That again comes out of John chapter 8. Where he said to those that believed on him, if you would be my disciples indeed, continue in the things that I've told you, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Whee! What a feeling. I have to tell you, so much that binds us, so much that takes our lives and puts them under pressure, are the things that we have planned, the issues that we have written into our agenda, and God says, look. And I, this is, I know, from a, a Walt Disney movie. Let it go, let it go. Let it, somebody should incorporate that into the hymn book. Let it go. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. You know, most of us, and for you guys and our students, we've got this idea that being free, that freedom is being able to do what we want. I used to work at a 700 bed facility and the people that were incarcerated in that facility were locked up for doing what they wanted. Freedom is not the ability. Liberty is not the ability to do what you want. It's the ability for you to do as you ought. How many times have you said, I know what I ought to do, but... <laughs> and you take the but route and you find yourself in a whole lot of trouble because you didn't do as you ought. By the way, when you do what is... Get this, okay? This is a little childish etymology that when you do what you ought not when you do what is not oughty say that real fast a few times and it ends up coming out like this not oughty, 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 not oughty and you thought that was a word for kids I've had to learn that my perspective on life, when I do as I ought not, is naughty. It is sin in the sight of a holy God. And it binds my life and keeps me from doing what God would have me to do and to see. Let's continue reading. Verse 35, for whosoever seeks to save his life shall lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel, that person shall keep it. That person shall save it. Another word that could be used here, that person shall discover it. You'll, you'll find, here, here, I, I gotta read this to you. When we say no to the things of the world and we open our hearts to the love of God, it's hard to imagine the freedom we find from the things that we've left behind. It's hard to imagine the freedom we find from the things that we've left behind. We show a love for the world in our lives by worshiping goods we possess. When Jesus says, lay all your treasures aside and love God above all the rest. Because when we say no to the things of the world, when we open our hearts to the love of the Lord, it's Hard to imagine the freedom we find from the things that we've left behind. And I've had my heart broken as I've had to say goodbye to plans that I figured were the best. And say, not my will, but thine be done. And, and by the way, this is the gospel to believers, okay? Okay. Verse 36, for what shall it benefit a person if they gain the entire world and forfeit, lose their soul? And your soul is yourself. It's who you are. What would it profit 
hurt you if you were to somehow gain the whole world. And we've got these oligarchs out there today that own billions, and some of them began developing their billions in their backyard garage. And today, they are the best known names on the planet. But what if they gained the whole world, but in the end lost their soul? What benefit would that be? And here's the next, the next verse. Or what would a person trade for their soul? Okay, we're talking about the cost of discipleship. I want to just kind of reverse that a bit and look at it from this perspective. What price have you put on your soul? Because that's what it boils down to. Verse 38, for any who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man shall also be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory of the Father with the holy angels. It's interesting, but in 1 John chapter 2, as it speaks about our love for the world and the things that are in the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, James chapter 4 goes into the same thing about friendship with the world, that it's enmity with God. Where are you at in your relationship with God? Are you struggling in your walk with the Lord? How is your DQ? My wife works at the Dairy Queen two nights of the week. How is your discipleship quotient? That's the real meaning of DQ this morning. And you may barter your hope of eternity's morn for a moment of joy at the most, for the glitter of sin and the things that will win. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? What it costs to be a disciple and the price tag that you have put on your own soul as a child for whom Jesus died. He gave all that he is. He gave all that he had. He gave all that he was as he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors and bare the sins of many and made intercession, made peace with God on your behalf at the cross. Let us pray. Father, we know what your word says about a coming kingdom. We read about it in Daniel. We read about it throughout the New Testament. It should be so clear to us, and yet we forfeit this bright, this brightest of prospects for the darkness that this world has to offer. We get concerned about our degrees in college. We get concerned about our place in corporate America, even perhaps the corporate world. And yet there's a new world coming. A kingdom of God which shall not fail. And this morning we bow before King Jesus and the word of our hearts would be not this world, but the world that is to come. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Bless our time as we finish this service and as we go into another week. Might what is accomplished be done, be accomplished for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What you decide? Ah, here he is. I, I have to tell you that Brother Jason, uh, he challenged his own heart this morning, and uh, I'm proud of you. And if he makes any mistakes and anybody points it out to you, you're in trouble with me. But he is playing a song with five flats. <clears throat> and And 
Gracie has always said to me, don't give me those songs with all the flats. And I gave him one this morning. He said, I think I can do it. And he's going to prove that to us. Okay. But let's stand together. And uh, I'm looking for someone to bring the words of our hymn up. Um, okay. If you could, the words to our response song. Okay. I'd rather have Jesus. Go ahead, Jason. Jesus, that silver or gold, I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a land. Jesus, that anything this world. 